And now I am pleased to introduce the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, Dr. Holly Humphrey. Hello, everyone. My name is Holly Humphrey. I am the president of the foundation, as you just heard. For the 15 years immediately prior to joining the Macy Foundation, I was the Dean for Medical Education at the University of Chicago and a pulmonary and critical care physician. It is a real privilege for me to be able to share today's webinar with our nursing colleagues. Over the course of the next several minutes, we will have a chance to hear from each of the individuals whose names you see appear on the screen. These individuals actually were all members of our Macy Foundation conference that took place almost one year ago. I'd like to provide some background to that conference and will do so over the course of this webinar. After I present that background, we will hear an overview on the broad topic of structural racism together with recommendations from our Macy Foundation sponsored conference. After that, there will be, I hope, sufficient and um, sufficient time for robust conversation with each of you attending today. And then finally, we will have um, some concluding comments following the question and answer. So let's get started. As I mentioned, we sponsored a conference nearly a year ago based primarily on the fact that we are well aware that the current healthcare workforce does not reflect the diverse identities and experiences that affect people's health and their health care. There are relatively few initiatives to improve the diversity of the workforce that have been replicable or sustainable over time. Advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within the health professions is central to improving the overall well being in the United States and reducing attrition among historically underrepresented populations in health professions, schools, and in professional practice. The conference that I've referred to several times involved 44 leaders in health professions education, healthcare delivery, learners, and educational accreditors. In preparation for our conference, we commissioned four papers and three case studies. And after several days of debate and deliberation, the conferees arrived at four recommendations that were established by consensus and then refined by our planning committee and ultimately approved by all conferees. During the conference, several themes emerged, including structural and systematic change, a common language on diversity, equity, and inclusion, effective incentives to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, intersectionality and the many challenges posed by intersectionality, and then implementation of interprofessional education, training, and coursework really has the opportunity to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion when done thoughtfully. I'd now like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Cheryl Gis Giscombe, who was one of our conferees and an important leader in nursing today. Cheryl? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a major focus of our conference was health disparities and the glaring and disturbing statistics that affect many populations that are considered underrepresented. For example, at birth, African-American men and women live an average of 75.5 years, while white men and women live an average of 78.9 years. African-American infant mortality rates are 11.1, double the white infant mortality rate of 5.0. 
African American women and American Indian Alaskan Native women are more likely to have a pregnancy related death than white women. And you can see 41 and 30 per 100,000 live births respectively compared to white women where there's 13 per 100,000 live births. A major concept uh, for us all to understand and delves deeply into addressing is structural racism. Racism that is embedded into laws, policies, and institutions and provides advantages to the dominant racial group while oppressing, disadvantaging, or neglecting other racial groups. Socioeconomic difference does not explain racial inequality or what we consider inequity. Systems contribute significantly to these disparities and they can be seen in areas including residential segregation, the criminal justice system, the public education system, and immigration policy. So there are a number of resources that provide illustrative statistics about diversity in nursing school enrollment, particularly as nursing school enrollment uh, representation can be compared to the United States population diversity among various racial ethnic groups. So what you can see here from this slide is that among certain groups, um, there's what we might consider statistical overrepresentation, and other groups statistical underrepresentation. For example, if we look at the first column of statistics among white Americans, there are 71% of students enrolled in entry-level BSN programs, and this is data from 2013, compared to 62% of the United States population. And you can look across and see that that number is fairly consistent among entry-level BSN programs in 2016, 2019, and registered nurses in 2018. And we compare that to other groups, such as Black or African Americans, um, where there's 10% and of, among students in 2013 enrolled in entry-level BSN programs across the board in 2016, 2019, and 12% registered nurses in African-Americans or Blacks or 12% of the U.S. population. When we look closely at other ethnic groups such as Asian, we see that there's 8% in 2013 and 2016 of entry-level BSN programs Whereas if we look all the way to the right, they're 20 of 2018 statistics, they're 6% of the US population. And an important thing to note also, is when you look at a large group such as Asian, um, Asians or Asian Americans, um, there's much more nuance to geographic region of origin nationality that doesn't, that these numbers here don't tell the full story of representation among certain groups of Asian population. Um, and the same can be said for Hispanic or Latino, um, or Latinx uh, nursing students. Um, you can see 8% in 2013, 11, 13, and 2016 and 2019. 5% of all registered nurses in the United States and 11% of the US population. So although the percentage of Hispanic or Latino nurses, nursing students is increasing over the years, it still has not uh, demonstrated uh, a representative uh, distribution or population of registered nurses in the United States. So more work needs to be done to consistently enroll and increase enrollment of Hispanic or Latino nursing students. And I won't st state all the numbers for the other groups who are more racist, for instance, you can read that, but I do want to highlight American Indian or, or Alaskan Native, where you may say, okay, 2013, 1% um, is included in the student nursing populations and BSN programs, and 1% when you look all the way to the right is the U.S. population, but we can look at the patterns in 2016.5%, 2019.5%, and then less than 1% of the nurses. And another thing, when we look at numbers about diversity and racial ethnic diversity, we want to also think about where those groups are practicing, and are they practicing in areas where that population resides? So what, what is um, the bigger picture on racial representation, racial ethnic representation, equity and diversity? So the numbers alone, um, they tell a story, but there's more to it. And so looking at the numbers and the trends are very important 
similarly with Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander groups, which right now are captured in the Asian American group, um, but that's another important nuance that needs to be considered. And so in 2018, we see that there's less than 1% of registered nurses and 2% of the US population. And then there's a line there for what's not known when there's no report of racial or ethnic background. So this uh, picture, this slide tells us a story about the distribution of racial ethnic groups among different nursing program types. So we see BSN, masters, research focused doctoral, which includes a PhD and DN, Doctor of Nursing Science, DNS, and then DNP, Doctor of Nursing Practice. So you can just take a few moments to take a look at each of these pie charts as well as the overall U.S. population representation. And if we just look at baccalaureate and master's programs, we just compare those for a moment, we see that there appears to be more representation uh, when you think about racial ethnic group diversity among master's students compared to bachelor students and among research focused doctoral students compared to doctor of nursing practice. Um, because there's so much detail in these pie charts, we invite you all to review this again with your colleagues um, because it can lend itself to very rich conversation about the status of the United States, but we also invite you to think about that in terms of your programs at your universities or at your in your state more broadly. So to kind of circle back to what we envision, what the Macy Conference envision, um, the conference vision statement is here. Our nation's health professions learning environments from classrooms to clinical sites to virtual spaces should be diverse, equitable and inclusive of everyone in them, no matter who they are. Every person who works, learns, or receives care in these places should feel that they belong there. So diversity in terms of numbers is a major issue, but that's just the first step. Belonging and acceptance are very important issues that we also address in our report. Next, I'd like to share the platform um, and introduce my colleague, Dr. Greer Glazier. Nice to be with everyone. I want to start by saying that in order to discuss all four recommendations, we could probably spend a whole day doing that. So what we are going to do is present very briefly the recommendation and only have some examples of some of the action steps. For rec recommendation one, there are actually 12 action steps in the report. They're associated with uh, providing recommendations for governing boards, leaders, deans, federal and state bodies, health professions, accrediting bodies, and foundations. Selected action steps include evidence-based training, multi-year strategic plans, tracking and studying, and repeatedly internally and externally equi equity metrics, incentivizing our clinical sites to prioritize this work, looking at all of our policies and procedures that reflect this work, providing incentives based to performance evaluation and visual representation in his, of historically marginalized groups and institutions, both physically, visually, and virtually. This report encourages all of us to make bold changes to the status quo. We can no longer protect privilege and we cannot tolerate racism, and all of the other isms. Ableism, sexism, ageism, heterosexism, and classism. I believe that going back to the words chosen are very important. The first word here is build. This means it's going to be a process. It takes lots of people to do this work based on knowledge, attitudes, and skills, and we have to have a goal in mind for what the outcome is. This work takes attention, very close attention to the metrics which must be measured precisely. A culture, 
There are many definitions. I've chosen to put together a lot of them. It's customs, language, characteristics, knowledge, special habits of a particular group. It's simply the way of life of a group and how they do things. Obviously, each person brings their own unique culture to the group and creating a group culture is hard work. It doesn't happen overnight. I love this quote, culture eats strategy for lunch. From my perspective, having led two colleges of nursing as a dean, building a culture is absolutely the most important thing a dean does. Everything else that we do, every strategy is impacted by our culture. As I said earlier, building a culture isn't done alone. What results in a culture of fairness, respect, and anti-racism starts with the development of a strategic map or plan by all stakeholders. I want to give our uh, University of Cincinnati example of we have a one-page strategic map that was developed over eight months period when I became dean with faculty, staff, students, board members, and alumni participating. We voted on it. We agreed to use it as a guide for all of our work together. Everyone knows its contents and it does guide all of our work, unlike most places where they've got many pages of a strategic plan and you would not be able to recite what's in it. Committees and individuals develop their goals on it. They evaluate yearly progress and revisions are constantly made. This all starts with the college vision. What started seven years ago as through the creative leveraging of technology, the UC College of Nursing will lead and impact the transformation of healthcare in partnership with those we serve, evolved through to through the creative leveraging of technology, innovation, and inclusive excellence. The College of Nursing will lead and impact the transformation of healthcare through strategic partnerships. Inclusive excellence is in our DNA. Our fifth goal is all about culture. Cultivate the culture of health with our core values, strategic priorities, and norms of the college. And we made these explicit, a very important point in the entire report. Our values are collaboration, accountability, integrity, respect, and excellence. Within this goal is an explicit strategy to enhance a culture of inclusive excellence. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee has evolved to also form goals that are just like the others. We have decided to study structural racism, again, a word you read throughout the report this year. Interestingly, all of the members of this committee who must apply to be a member and are chosen from all of those stakeholders that I reported before, they need to take a Racial Equity Institute groundwater training so we all start out with the basic knowledge. Last thing I want to mention is it has to be a top priority. How does that happen? It happens if it's part of a living, breathing, strategic plan that has been developed by a group with concrete, actionable items, and it is the basis for all you do, and it's owned by all. Now I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Ann Kurth. Thank you, Greer. And we're turning now to uh, recommendation number two, as you see here, develop, assess, and improve systems to mitigate harmful bias and eliminate racism and all other forms of discrimination. So a couple of points to begin with. This recommendation is pertinent to relevant, is re really pertinent to healthcare delivery organizations and health professions, nursing schools, um, educational institutions. So I hope that many of you attending today are from all that range of, of sectors because it takes all of us to educate uh, the, the next generation of nurses. And many of us in our organizations track uh, organizational goals and structures that can touch on diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, and anti-oppression work um, to reduce and prevent uh, bias. That might be governance, recruitment, evaluation, promotion and advancement, resource allocation. Remember, budgets are moral documents. Um, are we allocating money to this work? Compensation, recognition, communication, the physical environment, the patient experience, and then the measurement and improvement processes themselves. So many of us have systems 
and metrics that we are tracking that may be pertinent to diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-racism, and anti-oppressive work, or we may need to develop some new systems. Now in nursing, we know if we don't document it or track it, we can't improve it. So I would say that this moment, uh, certainly in the nation in the last year, of the opportunity to address racism specifically in health education and the healthcare delivery system is a tremendous opportunity for us in nursing to both develop and share and improve and implement best practices. Again, the goal should be to be proactive. We wanna prevent, not just mitigate, bias, racism, homophobia, um, uh, all the other forms of discrimination that we've discussed. This does take institutional commitment, and it also can utilize systems of tracking, including the use of digital technology to track. Recommendation two from the report here um, outlines nine specific action steps. These include, just the, at a high level, an interprofessional focus on learner success, DEI metrics, and it's important to think about using mixed methods and qualitative lived experience documentation as well, that can be seen as key performance indicators and tracking for bias, discrimination, episode prevention, and adjudication. Sharing DEI data at the national level. So for example, there could be a reporting of DEI data to AAMC, CCNE, all the accreditors and other national organizations that are relevant to us in nursing and midwifery. And of course, we want to ensure privacy protection for those data. So if you're coming from a school of nursing setting, you're going to want to think about um, the experience of the students. How are we looking and tracking um, DEI metrics in recruitment, matriculation, the student experience across their entire educational trajectory, and then evaluation and credentialing. So for example, the NCLEX exam, some students have been writing um, to see if there can be some modification of the questions, because even the framing of evaluation questions can have an impact. You'll want to think about your faculty. How are we recruiting? What is the trajectory of our underrepresented faculty in particular uh, and experience that they have in the community of the school? How do we retain and, and uh, provide opportunity for leadership without burdening um, BIPOC faculty? And there are systems that are evolving around how to do best practices in hiring with blinded reviews, implicit bias training for search committees, um, and even looking at appointments and, and promotions um, for, for signs of bias. And then finally, in the health system, we need to be looking um, at, at metrics that we're tracking. This student generation is really committed to addressing structural racism. I think that's an incredible strength. Um, there are many touch points across that experience that we can improve. Uh, and I think that one of the key things is, is also to think about ensuring success. That's that equity question. At the Yale School of Nursing, one of the things we've done as a small example is that we've created academic success teams. These are teams that can be activated by the students themselves. Um, and it addresses holistically the issues that may be interfering with the students' maximized success um, in, in, the, in the classroom. You have to be able to convey uh, as a leader a zero tolerance for racism and other forms of bias and also work with faculty um, to ensure that the culture change uh, occurs over time. We're, we've added, for example, uh, at the Yale School of Nursing, um, DEI and anti-racism work as a metric in our annual faculty evaluations. How are you engaging in this work? How are you putting it into practice with your teaching, your practice, uh, and your research? And then finally, the, the bias and discrimination reporting systems, having clear protocols for that, um, and how are things reported um, and adjudicated using ideally restorative justice kind of framework so that we can bring the parties together and hopefully um, improve all, all the encounters, whether it's in a precepting situation or the classroom. So we have a great opportunity here um, in our schools of nursing and in our healthcare settings to address this incredibly important issue of our time. And I will now uh, turn it over for recommendation three, back to Cheryl. Recommendation three is integrate equity into health professions curricula explicitly aiming to mitigate the harmful effects of bias, exclusion, discrimination, racism, and all other forms of oppression. This is important for us to remember the word all. So we're thinking about racial ethnic groups, groups that may experience differences in ability, uh, people who identify as LGBTQIA, or other groups that have been subjected to oppression, discrimination, and racial um, bias or exclusion. And so the key term here also is professions curricula. 
So how do we consider integrating this content into our curricula so we educate the next generations of healthcare professionals and nurses in particular, so that this is part of the culture of their education, part of the culture of how they work with patients, clients, communities, families. At UNC Chapel Hill, for example, our mission statement includes distinctly on being empowered to advance health for all. And one of our values, one of the most important ones among all of them is diversity, integrity, excellence. All of those things address, uh, address the curricula in terms of guiding the faculty, staff, and students to consistently evaluate and improve or make suggestions for improvements in the curricula to um, be in uh, congruence with this recommendation. And some of the action steps that are included in the report include um, addressing not only what we do in schools of nursing or in training programs, but also considering accreditation bodies that should require all healthcare profession schools to conduct and make transparent a rigorous and holistic self-study of their institutional histories that have positively and negatively affected curricula, the learning environment and patient care. Another action step includes health professions education institutions should in the spirit of continuous quality improvement, regularly assess learning environments and programs for evidence of harmful bias and discrimination using learner feedback as a critical source of information. And learner feedback could be uh, from current learners from, or from alumni. Health profession schools should also co-create with their communities, both educational experiential opportunity to help learners understand the places where they, the patients live, work, and play. The important thing about addressing curricula uh, also includes sustainability. If you have a group of stakeholders in a school of nursing or training program that are champions of integrating the addressing of discrimination, racism, and other forms of oppression and bias in the curriculum, uh, one thing that needs to be considered is how sustainable is that plan? How sustainable is that policy? Is that a policy that leaves when those faculty leave or when that leader leaves? Or is that a, a policy or a plan that can be forevermore in the fabric of that institution? So as schools and representatives of schools, you know, consider these recommendations, can, you can also consider how do these recommendations, um, how can they continue to be sustained? Other examples um, of recommendation three that are existing in, at my institution include a really close examination of the readings, the assignments that are um, required for students at all levels of learning and making sure to integrate readings that are consistent with this value. And if not, then working together to make sure we integrate those materials and resources in each class. So students see that as part of their educational experience and not an adjunct or a supplement. Thank you. Next, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. The fourth recommendation deals with increasing the number of students, faculty, and administrators and leaders from historically marginalized and excluded populations with 10 action steps in the report. Selected ones include knowing the diversity and representation of your stakeholders, examination of policies, procedures, and processes, supporting student success, as well as retention and identifying barriers, partnering with K through 12 schools with early and continued exposure to nursing, collection of standardized diversity related student and faculty data with transparency so everyone can see the data and reporting the data, adoption of holistic admission processes and implicit bias training. Because of the time limits for right now, I'm only going to be able to talk about students in a little bit there. So we talk about increasing the number of health profession students from historically marginalized and excluded populations. So this means we're looking at people that are um, oppressed, people that have been considered outside of 
uh, they're controlled, don't have the same opportunities as more privileged groups in society. This may include uh, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, nationality, language, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, geography, disability, and age. So these are the students that we wanna increase in our nursing programs. And we can't do that if we don't count them. One of the greatest issues that I have encountered both in my own work as Dean and as a consultant on this work is most schools just are not collecting these data. Often of even the data they're collecting, it's reported as an aggregate and issues of simple numbers by program are not reviewed and acted upon. For instance, I might report that the historically marginalized and excluded populations represent 21% of the students at University of Cincinnati. However, the diversity of by program could be widely different with the undergraduate program having a population of historically marginalized and excluded students of maybe 8%. And our graduate program might be 36%. But we need to dig in deeper. Whereas our graduate program may look pretty good with 36% of our students being from historically marginalized and excluded students. Is it okay if our nurse midwifery program only has 3% of such students and our FMP is 36%? I'm not saying those are our real numbers. I'm giving you a hypothetical. <laughs> and really, who's responsible for this? Is this just the dean and the admissions people or everybody that is part of the college and the programs? This isn't okay with me. The action steps call for collection of this data and making it transparent, as well as holding people accountable for the numbers. At the University of Cincinnati College of Nursing, we look at the data every single semester with the whole leadership team, which does include every program director. Everybody sees everyone else's data. Our program directors go back to their individual programs. They talk with their faculty and staff, students too, and present the data Groups discuss how the numbers reflect targets that have been set, they identify issues, and program goals are set addressing this review. I wanna give you another concrete example of where I feel we've fallen short in nursing programs related to collecting data. Increasing numbers starts with collecting the right data. It starts with admissions processes. I've rarely seen schools or programs routinely collect and look at this data in a comprehensive way by looking at the factors that we've discussed. And I'll just take race, ethnicity, and gender as a few for right now. What we really need to be looking at is how many students applied, how many were qualified, how many actually were accepted, how many accepted us and were enrolled, how many were retained, how many graduated, and how many passed their exams, whether they be an NCLEX or a certification exam. Not only does this information need to be collected and analyzed, but we need to do it over time, and we need to look for trends. I recently consulted with a college that had few black students in their undergraduate program, and after retrospectively looking at the data together, we identified that their biggest problem was that although they had black students applying, very few were being accepted. And the trend, as Cheryl talked about before, the trend there got worse over the last three years. At the University of Cincinnati College of Nursing, our biggest issue was our retention rate from freshman to sophomore year. When I got to University of Cincinnati, our retention rate of underrepresented students from freshman to sophomore year was 34%. So we applied for funding to be able to implement a success program called Leadership 2.0, which we have written about, that starts uh, the summer before college and goes through the sophomore year. Once we finished that grant and we had that program pretty well implemented, we then moved on to say, we need more students in the pipeline. So we did start working with um, ninth, through 12th graders in the Cincinnati public schools and developed a program there. So with that, I wanna um, end my section by saying, um, I agree, 
a huge issue that we've got is the sustainability. The only way to um, implement a lot of these programs is to have funding. And the way many of us do that is to get federal funding and large amounts of money. But we really um, need to think about what are we going to do when the funding stops? So I am really happy to say that we were able to institutionalize much of our work from both projects. Um, it has to do with our strategic map and the fact that I'm Dean and I'm able to raise money from people for these efforts too. So with this, I'd like to go back to my colleague, Cheryl Giscombe. Bay. So, we're really glad that we will continue to have follow up webinars um, to continue these discussions. And just want to highlight the people who were involved in this current webinar will also be involved in the follow up nursing webinar. Um, you may notice that we're talking a lot about nursing educational settings, nursing schools and training programs. And we also want to make sure that in our conversations about nursing and increasing equity and reducing bias, that we also highlight the clinical practice settings. And so the follow-up webinar will focus more on that environment. And we know that is also critical for our learners because they do the bulk of their learning in clinical environments. But that's also very important for nurses who work in those environments and the patients, clients, families, communities who are receiving care in those environments. So along with the ones of us you see here, um, myself including Greg Glazier, Ann Kurth, and Holly Humphrey, we will have Greg Adams, Chairman and CEO of Kaiser Foundation Health Plan Incorporated and Hospitals. We also have a upcoming webinars this year because there's so much to be discussed that cannot be captured all in one session. So on February 25th, we will have the topic uh, to address racism among patients and how health profession students and educators and clinicians, uh, you know, grasp that, cope with that, deal with that professionally. Um, we often talk about the racism or discrimination or bias on the part of the provider or the educator, but we also know that there are experiences of patients expressing racism or discriminatory beliefs or practices towards the providers or other workers and staff in the healthcare setting. March 11th will address issues related to discrimination, bias, and oppression, and harmful practices um, that need to be addressed to promote equity among the LGBTQ plus population. Then April 7th, we will address anti-Black racism. And in July, there will be a seminar specifically focusing on people with disabilities. So now we're really excited about engaging in a dynamic way with all of you have, who have chosen to attend today's session. So we are now entering the Q&A component of today's event. We invite you all to use the Q&A function to ask questions. And you can find uh, the report uh, to refer to during this session and afterwards at the link uh, below. Thank you, Cheryl, and, and thank you, panelists. Um, I'll be um, feeding to the panelists some of the questions that are coming in. I also wanted to remind uh, the attendees that the chat function is now enabled, and we would encourage you to use that as a way to share information among your fellow attendees and the panelists or any best practices that you might be involved in addressing this important issue. Uh, the first question um, is, uh, has been raised by several people and it has to do with training uh, around addressing bias and discrimination in the classroom and clinical learning environment. Um, do you have um, any recommendations as to um, the optimal form given that people are starting at different levels? That's a great question, Peter. Thanks for... Uh asking that one first, um, because that's where we all want to go in the direction of educating and informing ourselves so we can do more in this area. And so I'll start and then I'll hand it off to my colleagues. Um, there are numerous training programs across the country that are available in person and now in our COVID um, pandemic era, they're available 
virtually um, via webinar and uh, online. And so I, I won't name, start to name them yet. Um, some of my colleagues may because I just don't want to name some and leave some out. But that each state uh, uh, um, board of nursing has resources and content available for this. Many schools of nursing have already started to require this sort of training among their faculty, or they are starting to also uh, develop their own training. And AACN is a wonderful resource for this type of training, as well as for uh, referring schools of nursing and other nursing institutions for the, the training. And you may also consider uh, some of the other nursing organizations, such as the National League for Nursing, uh, the American Nurses Association, and other individual um, nursing organizations that may be more specific to the clinical uh, population of focus. I will also um, go ahead and pass this off to my other colleagues because I'm sure they also have information to share in response to this question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just quickly um, respond that uh, I think it all starts with people understanding themselves, their own attitudes and um, behaviors. And so I think we've got to be able to be comfortable about what we believe and think and be able to have conversations with people that are safe. So actually, so we are starting with having safe conversations uh, with our uh, faculty, staff, and students about uh, race, about racism, history of systemic racism and white privilege. We're bringing in videos and trainings from all sorts of places that, that are available. Um, uh, we have a bibliography, as I mentioned, the Racial Equity Institute has great information for just the history related to all of this. And one of the groups that has a lot of work that's not nursing is uh, the AAMC, American Association of Medical Colleges. So um, the, when we went looking for the best I don't think there's any the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's a lot of good ones out there and you've just got to look at them and see what seems right for your place. And just to go back to the action step from recommendation three that I um, mentioned earlier, and this goes along with what Greg Glazer just shared, it's important for each organization to do a self-assessment, to understand the history and trends, maybe even how um, students and faculty and staff have moved through the organization and understanding what causes, um, what supports retention and what are the factors that may cause people to leave. Um, and I agree too that it's important for uh, organizations to engage in safe conversations to create safe spaces. And uh, that's something that we're also doing at UNC Chapel Hill weekly. Um, faculty and staff are leading seminars and we're having discussion groups with our faculty and staff, but also with our students and it does start at home. But of course, professional uh, integration, integration of professional expertise is also important um, because sometimes you don't know what you're doing or in terms of you don't know what you're not seeing and you may need a person who's unbiased to come in and help you to understand those things. Thank you. Um, several um, attendees have asked about uh, model curriculums. Um, particularly, is there, are there any module-based health disparity curricula that can be used virtually? Those who are dealing, obviously, educating in a pandemic environment. Well, one of the colleagues on the uh, seminar just mentioned Greg Glazier, REI, the Racial Equity Institute, um, that is one of the most popular um, resources um, and they do include modules to help with this work. Um, what are some others colleagues that you may wanna share? So uh, we're, we're, we're currently working with a group called Structural, Co Structural Competency, which is uh, located on the West Coast. And again, because it is the COVID era, we're, we're doing all this now um, virtually. Um, so those materials are ones that we're going to, to tape. Um, uh, I think what we uh, have the opportunity to do also in nursing is to develop more, more training materials um, that sort of are 
current um, and that fit our pedagogy. So for example, um, we all are aware of bias and discrimination episodes that happen in real life to students, uh, you know, to, to faculty, um, both in the, in the classrooms and in healthcare settings. Um, and we're looking at how we might be able to work some of those up as clinical simulation. Um, so that people can actually go through that, the, the experience and do the appropriate debriefing um, so that we start to incorporate uh, more of these tools in, in our teaching toolkit. And, and as Greer mentioned and Cheryl mentioned, we also try to um, collate uh, the available um, readings, uh, coursework uh, and materials for, for our, our, um, our faculty as well. I would say that I hope we all don't develop our own it seems that this is something we all need. So it would seem like having model curriculum for health disparities and all of these other topics would be a really great project for us all to be working on together and at the national level. And this isn't a great opportunity to also consult with organizations that have been historically in existence and created to support the um, equitable inclusion of underrepresented groups such as the National Black Nurses Association, um, the Hispanic Nurses Association, the Asian and Pacific Islander uh, Nursing Associations. Those organizations have been grappling with these issues for decades and will likely have resources available um, that maybe um, have been overlooked by groups that may not have thought that they you know, there was an alignment with that organization, but this is a great time to connect to those organizations and, um, you know, inquire about what resources they have available to share. Thank you. Uh, next question has to do with um, bringing the community into the classroom to enhance students' understanding of their patient's experience. What advice do you have for partnering with community members and or patients to do this? Well, community engagement is a, just a major factor in providing exceptional health care across the board. And so um, one strategy um, that many schools of nursing have uh, taken upon themselves to do is to identify uh, faculty um, administrators um, who are known as diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders. That may be someone with a highly ranked faculty position, all the way ranging to someone with an associate dean title. And with that, there's resources created to and generated to elevate a position such as that for someone who has time and resources to think about these things, including community engagement, because we know to provide equitable care, we have to include um, members who are in the community. Did I lose you? So um, we, we bring members of the community into our class sessions. Uh, we bring members of the community to be our standardized patients when we're teaching assessment. And what I think is a really great thing is uh, our faculty at University of Cincinnati have developed interactive case studies. So you can be assured that all of your students get X experience. So, you know, this is the problem with all of our clinical. You don't know who's going to show up on the day that somebody has to be doing clinical. So in this way, if we really think it's important that people all have experience with the variety of groups that we've talked about, we could develop these interactive case studies and everybody gets that content in that way. And similar to community engaged research, where it's important to have a community advisory board or a board of stakeholders that are advising the research process, that's also a, a potential essential component of these efforts to make sure you're engaging community in the development of curricula and clinical experiences. So incorporating a community advisory board to guide these efforts in the School of Nursing may also be a wonderful strategy. I want to bring up one other thing that I think is a really great thing that a number of groups have done. Um, we've moved to a holistic admission process. We let anybody be part of our admissions process if they go through the training. So community members are helping to um, do the um, MMIs, the structured interviews, and they're um, you know helping us select the next group of nurses. 
Thank you. Um, the next question gets at the issue of leadership. Um, and um, the attendee wants to know is if you have any suggestions where leadership, in fact, may not have bought into it or believe that racism or health disparities or implicit bias is a problem. That's an excellent question. Since I've started answering most of the questions first, I, I would love to um, uh, hear from my colleagues and then I'll follow up if I have additional content to add. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, obviously, leadership can make a difference and gra grassroots and ground up can also make a difference. And so um, I think, you know, one of the challenges that we face in nursing um, is that uh, the recognition that, 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 that structural racism and other isms, homophobia, um, uh, problems with uh, addressing disability, um, they, they are structural. We are all engaged with them. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's a challenge to get uh, to get faculty um, to, to sort of be able to adapt and, and, and modify. So it is important to have that leadership um, uh, endorsement that this is something we all have to be engaged with, with. But it really does take everybody to engage in it across the entirety of, of, of the learning system. And that includes the healthcare system. So I think increasingly, you know, as, as, as hospitals also realize that, that this has to be a part of their, um, their community metrics, um, that is something we can work with in the schools of nursing as well. But certainly um, convincing leadership. And if this last year hasn't done that, um, it's, it's hard to say what will. I love the question. I mean, the first recommendation was all about a culture that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the Macy Foundation is coming out with this recommendation. So if deans and other leaders do not believe that that should be a top priority, then it seems to me that that's got to be an issue for the leadership that are um, working with those deans. I think that in, in reality, there are a number of people that this is not a priority for them. You know, there's so many competing priorities. It's just not. So, you know, I think what people have to do is they have to ask themselves, is this the right fit for me in this institution? And sometimes if the leadership is absolutely not interested in forwarding any of this work that has to get done because it's time intensive and it's got to be uh, something that people are working on daily, if they aren't doing that and, and you think it's very important, you might not be in the right place if that happens to be your institution. Yes, and I'll just add that excellent considerations would be including um, values related to diversity and equity in mission statements as we have at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and when there are search committees for deans, associate deans, faculty, there are questions on the interviews about people's uh, uh, perspectives about diversity and equity. So each potential hire has an opportunity to share not only their perspectives, but their practices and previous experiences. So then the selection committees can have a really good um, or decent understanding of where that person stands if you consider that to be a core, and hopefully you do, of your institution and your culture moving forward. I'm so glad you brought that up, Cheryl. I'm gonna read you a question that people have to answer for us when they apply for a position. As an equal opportunity employer with a diverse staff and student population, please share your how your qualifications prepare you to work in a campus environment with faculty, staff, and students from cultures and backgrounds different from your own. And I can tell you, you can tell um, a lot from that question, they, we get wide variety of responses to that. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, gets at the role of accreditors. What role can accrediting bodies play in trying to address harmful bias and discrimination in the learning environments? I think that's an excellent question. And um, I know, I think it was Guru who mentioned the AAMC. Um, I know that that's something that they're working on. We previously had our physician session, um, our medical school session earlier, and nursing can also continue to do the same. I know we are in that place of, in that direction, um, but when a school or healthcare institution is being uh, assessed, the criteria for assessment should include where that organization is, where that school is in terms of equity, 
diversity, curriculum, policies. Um, so it's part of what or part of how an, a school or institution is evaluated. Um, because we, we know there's so many priorities that it could become secondary, tertiary, or not even on you know, the agenda. But if uh, a school or institution knows this is how you're going to be evaluated, this is how you're gonna reach a certain status, then there is no, no, there's not a lot of latitude for choice of where this is in priorities. And so accreditation bodies can help that in terms of helping support and motivate um, institutions and schools to prioritize. It's a very it's a very powerful lever, and we we sort of um, you know endorse uh, the exploration of that uh, as in recommendation to also reporting um, data on on diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as part of uh, to, to the national credentialers um, and national bodies. So there's an opportunity there. And an opportunity too for um, licensing exams, the, the d developers of those exams to include more of this content across the board for the different populations we've talked about. So students see it again as core, uh, a core component of their curriculum and not an add-on, not something that you know we're choosing to make them do, but this is part of your responsibility as a, a licensed healthcare professional. Thank you. Um, the next question um, is asking, how can minority faculty manage students who demonstrate overt or covert racist behaviors? So I imagine that that's meant to, who, how, can they, how can they help underrepresented students manage being maybe a recipient or a victim of overt racism? I think I that's sure one way to interpret that, yes. Um, and I would first start to say that I think that is a responsibility of all faculty and leaders and not only um, the faculty and staff or leaders of color. I think that responsibility needs to be shared um, and creating an, a safe environment for open dialogue, helping students to feel like they can go and talk to someone and that their grade is not going to be affected or their reputation in the school is not going to be affected. Um, sometimes that means having staff in the student affairs department of the School of Nursing that are the go-to people who are trained and clearly sensitive to these issues. We have people like that in our student affairs department at, at UNC. Um, but it, again, it goes across the board because if that person's not available, the student should not have to wait in shame or in silence to share their experience. And this is a very important issue um, that many students say they face and they do so in silence and it affects their stress level, affects their confidence, affects even their trust in the professionalism of their faculty and staff. So um, clear training and discussions among faculty to create a safe space for students um, and their colleagues um, actually. Um, is important. Um, and that takes culture change and courage among the faculty. Thank I'll you. Just give a few more responses yes. to that. I mean, it's all about what the norms of the culture are and what the expectations are. And again, we talked at the beginning, a zero tolerance policy toward, toward this. And it is everyone's responsibility. So if it happens to be something that other people have observed, and seeing they need to be involved in the, reporting that and being part of a solution. You might need to have boxes that are um, throughout your facility that are um, anonymous <laughs> where people can report things so that they feel uh, you know, safe to be able to do that. But ultimately, again, I feel as if it is what is set at the top by the leadership. You have to know that you're going to have support in uh, reporting and there's going to be some kind of action because there's absolutely nothing worse than feeling like you've shared something that is very horrible and nothing's been done. So you've got to feel like there's going to be some kind of action related to it. Thank you. Um, we are at the hour. Um, so I will take one more question, even though there's many more in the queue. And I'm sorry we cannot get to all of them today. Final question, um, 
an attendee has asked, uh, many different schools of nursing have developed strong curricula and activities to teach diversity, inclusion, culture, humility. Are any of you aware of a structure that exists for schools to share these resources with each other? Is there a place um, instead of everyone reinventing the wheel? That is an excellent question. Um, so the AACN does have um, a area on their website with information about this topic. So there are organizations that do exist that have this content, but as we you know, advance and evolve, the content will advance and evolve as well. And so um, good ideas also include special issues of publication and perhaps um, conferences similar to this seminar that specifically focus on this topic. Um, because as we can see from the Q&A, there's so many other questions specifically related to the comment that was just made when you say there's a zero policy, but if a person's tenure, you know, there's, there's much more nuance to some of the answers we're given, um, but hopefully they're generating more questions and discussion for you all. So, um, so we want to help problem solve, and this is only the beginning, and we're really so happy that the Macy Foundation chose this topic um, to address racial equity and to reduce bias and discrimination because this is only the beginning of the conversation that can help us in the nursing profession to come up with structures and systems just as you suggested. Um, colleagues, what else would you like to share in response to that question? I'm just happy that we've got so much interest in the topic and I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Thanks for the engagement. Yes, yeah, so let me pick up on that. Um, it's really too bad that we are out of time today because we have so many um, questions in the chat that we haven't been able to get to. Um, however, as we already mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, um, we do have follow-up webinars uh, planned and we have at least one more that will be specifically um, a follow-up to today's webinar that will focus on nursing in the clinical learning environments. And we know that um, those are the environments where a lot of the issues related to harmful bias and um, discrimination take place. So I hope that um, you will join us again for that webinar. Um, we will also be doing our best to uh, follow up uh, with some answers to um, some of the questions that have been placed in the chat. We will likely do that um, through a blog posting um, by our, our co-hosts from today's webinar. Um, but most of all, I think that uh, we are convinced that although we began this work um, a year ago at our conference, there are so many um, issues as well as opportunities that we do not wanna miss the opportunity to try to really make social change um, in our clinical learning environments and for our future health professionals. So thank you for um, participating in today's webinar. I want to offer a special thanks to those who served as the co-hosts um, for today's webinar. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, all three of the co-hosts for today were um, very active participants in the Macy Foundation Conference where this conversation began and where the recommendations were first generated. So please stay tuned. Um, there is more to come and thank you so much for the way in which you engaged with us today and for the many questions that you posed to us. Thank you all. <laughs>